Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. I will talk about distrust and diplomacy in Asia seas. And there will also be a lot of maps, so I, I hope you're ready to be excited. Because I'm really excited. And I hope that it's informational and interesting, and that this talk encourages you to closely follow this issue that I think is really important. So let's get started. And first, we'll start with this. This is a Chinese submarine. Looks pretty nice. And this is a sign of some current troubles in Asia's waters. Uh, so the Chinese submarine, China is quickly expanding its military, especially its navy. So that means more submarines, more uh, other ships. Uh, they have an aircraft carrier, which is really big. There aren't many of those in the world. Uh, they have more missiles that can shoot down other ships. Uh, they're expanding their military very rapidly. And that has scared other Asian nations. And it scared the US as well, and a lot of countries. Uh, and as a result of China expanding their military, other countries are doing the same. And this is scaring other countries. Here's an example of why. This is not a Chinese ship. This is a cable of a Vietnamese oil company ship. And here's the cable. It's not supposed to look like that. The cable should go into the water, down to the bottom of the ocean, and they use it to look for oil at the bottom of the ocean. And last year, this boat was looking for oil, and a Chinese ship came and cut the cable. So that's not how it's supposed to be. That's pretty aggressive, and as a result, this is a sign of why other countries are afraid of China having a bigger navy. This is a good example of that. On a maybe more positive note, this, these are the countries of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. There are 10 countries, and uh, this organization was formed in 1967. It's been around for a long time. But for much of its history, it was pretty weak, uh, kind of an economic collaboration. But it wasn't very powerful, not, not like the uh, European Union, some other groups like that. But in the past few years, there has been a lot of collaboration between these countries. So this group is becoming more important, and it is related to today's issue. Two more things. This is US President Barack Obama and Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard. And last year, just a few months ago, they announced this new agreement. And the US will open a marine base in Australia, uh, on the north coast of Australia. There will be 2,500 Marines that will be stationed there. So the US is collaborating more with Australia and other countries as well. And one more thing. I'm sure many of you recognize this. This is the Korean ship Chonan, which was sunk in 2010. And here it's being lifted out of the water. And this wasn't caused by today's issue, but the aftermath of the sinking, kind of China's reaction to this, is related to today's issue. So this is also relevant. So the, there are a whole bunch of things I just mentioned. They might seem like they're not related at all. But they are all related because of this. This is a map. This is the South China Sea. And these boxes show you all of the places where there are conflicts about territory. Who controls what? And this water, and a lot of the water in Asia, is very important to the world's economy. So all of these issues can be related to this. And I will be talking about this today. All right, I'll tell you a little bit about me before I get too far into it. I've lived in Guangzhou for the past two years. Uh, I am an English teacher, or I was an English teacher. I actually just finished my job a few days ago. Uh, I will move to Seoul in a, very soon, maybe two weeks, and I will study Korean for a few months, and then I will move back to the United States. Uh, I'm talking about this topic today uh, because I have an interest in international relations. I studied political science in university, and in the United States, I will start a graduate program in international relations, and I will focus on Asia. So I'm very interested in this topic today. Uh, since I've lived in Korea, I, I've learned a lot more about Asia, and I think Asia is really going to be the center of the world in a lot of ways over the next few decades. So I want to continue learning more, and I think this issue that I'm talking about today is one of the most important things in Asia right now. And I hope by the end of today's talk, you think that as well. And before I start, I want to warn you that I, since I am an American, this talk will be mostly from an American perspective. 
So I'm sure that other people, especially maybe someone from China, would have a different perspective on this issue. So keep that in mind as I'm talking. I am talking as an American. I'm trying to be uh, to step back and look at it from a global perspective, but this is very American centered. So bear with me. Okay. Why should you care? Well, I said I care about this. I think it's very interesting. And I think all of you should care too. I think everyone should care because this issue affects everybody in the entire world. And it especially affects people in Asia. So my goal today is to tell you why you should care. And I hope when you leave, you do care. I'll give you two quick examples of why you should care. And this is one of them. This is an airplane. This is a picture taken out of an airplane. And this is Singapore. And on any given day, if you fly over Singapore, you will see something like this in the waters. It is an amazing number of huge ships that are carrying lots of things. There's a lot of oil that goes through there and a lot of other goods. And this is the Strait of Malacca. That is between Singapore and Malaysia and Indonesia. It's very narrow. In some places, it's only about 60 kilometers wide. So it's not a very uh, big area, but it's really important to Asia and to the world's economy. So this is what it looks like around Singapore. There's a lot of stuff passing through here. Uh, I was there in January, and I knew that Singapore was important, uh, an important shipping place. But I was really surprised when the plane took off and I saw this kind of view. It was amazing. I've never seen anything like it. So this area is really important. And so is the South China Sea, which is right here. And the South China Sea, these boxes are areas where there are territorial disputes. There's a lot of fighting about who owns these islands and this land. And I will talk more about that later. It's really important. Uh, and all of this is basically, there are a bunch of claims. There are many countries that are here, and they argue a lot about who controls what. And there are a lot of different issues. I will explain that a bit more today. So it's really important for the world's economy. And the South China Sea here, this is the second most used sea lane in the world. So out of the entire world, the second most number of ships go through here. Uh, it's half of all long distance shipping passes through here eventually. And a lot of the world's seafood comes from here as well. So this has a lot of different reasons why it's important. And by the way, I don't know what the number one sea lane in the world is, but maybe one of you will know. If you know, you, you should tell me. I'm very curious. I tried to find out, but I don't know. I couldn't find it. The other reason why this is so important is oil. Here's a list of the top five countries in the world that import oil. And United States, number one. OK, that's a lot of oil. But look at all these other countries. These are all in Asia. And these numbers are from 2009 to 2010. And I can guarantee that in the case of China and India, the numbers are quite a bit higher today. And they will continue to go up as more people drive and use oil in their daily lives. This is a lot of oil. And why this is so important is that none of these countries have their own oil. They are not getting oil domestically. It's all imported for the most part. So as they use more oil, they will need to continue to import. This oil mostly is coming from the Middle East, and it is passing through these sea lanes. So oil is important, obviously, to the world. It's very important to the world's economy. If there's some kind of conflict in these waters, the oil shortage will be one of the biggest problems that happens. So keep this in mind as I'm talking about this as well. And here's a map of oil flows to Asia. So here's the Middle East. Oil comes around India. Here is the Strait of Malacca through the South China Sea and China, South Korea, Japan. So a lot of oil is coming through here. It's millions of barrels of oil every day passes through this tiny little area. OK, let's, let's talk about geography a little bit. I will show you some maps and explain the area I'm talking about in more detail. Here's Asia. And where the conflicts are now, where the most problems are, is the South China Sea. It's not very big, but there are a lot of countries involved here, and it's really important. I also will talk a little bit about the Yellow Sea and East China Sea, which is relevant to South Korea. Uh, and the Indian Ocean, I will talk about a little bit as well. And I won't get too into the Indian Ocean and what's going on here, but that is also a lot of the same problems that are happening in the South China Sea are happening there as well. 
So that is worth its own talk, I think. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, and let's go back to the map of the South China Sea. Okay, so this is a particularly important area because this is where most of the problems are. Uh, and it's so important to the world's economy. So any significant disruption there would lead to a lot of problems. Uh, I'm going to talk later about these areas where I said there are conflicting claims. This is the Paracel Islands and the Spratly Islands. So these two island chains, uh, I will talk about them in more detail. So what's happening? What, what is causing these problems uh, in the water? Well, first, I want to tell you a little history of the modern Pacific Ocean. In World War II, Japan took over a lot of islands, a lot of Asia. Japan, uh, uh, not colonized, Japan occupied a lot of different places in Asia. And World War II was finished. Japan left these places, and the countries took back their control. And ever since that point, the US Navy has been kind of the dominant military power in Asia, in the Pacific Ocean. So US leadership and protection of the water kind of guaranteed uh, or protected Asian countries as they recovered from the war and they boomed economically. And I think, in many respects, the US military defense of the Asian waterways, that was one of the most important stabilizing forces in Asia. And it really helped the Asian countries including Korea and Japan, that helped them recover from uh, this terrible war that had a lot of problems. So the US military has been the stabilizing uh, force in these waters. And no other countries have really uh, fought against them militarily in the waters. There hasn't been any other country that has had as big of a navy, but it's been as powerful in the water. So the US has been the leader. But the rise of China, in particular, now is threatening that status. And that is a lot of what's scaring other countries. Uh, they are afraid because it's unsure if China will be the same as the US has been in Asia's waterways. I will talk about that very soon. Uh, the reactions of other Asian countries to the rise of China, that is also an important part of what's happening here. People are very afraid of what China is doing, and many people interpret it as China is becoming more aggressive, and that's not a good thing. There are conflicting territorial claims. Uh, there are these islands that I will talk about, and it's unclear who owns them, and no one wants to give up control for a bunch of reasons, and one of those is what you mentioned, which is the discovery of important natural resources, especially oil and natural gas. And the chart I showed about oil imports, that tells you how important oil is. And there is apparently a lot of oil in the South China Sea. And if a country can take control of that and harvest that, they won't have to import as much oil. That is obviously good for that country. And it shows you why countries are willing to argue about these islands that on their own are probably not all that important. And maybe, hopefully, there's also increased international cooperation as a result of these issues. I'll talk about all of these things today. And let's start with the rise of China. China will soon be the world's top economy. Uh, most people think 2015, 2016, China's economy will be bigger than that of the United States. So it is growing very rapidly. China is no doubt uh, going on, on track to become a superpower <coughs> in the world. And for years, people have talked of a peaceful rise when they talk about China. And, and China has advocated that as well for themselves. They have said, the way that they should grow is this peaceful rise where they cooperate with other countries and basically the policy is don't anger other people. Make sure that other people don't want to interfere with China so China can grow. And that's been the way that people have talked about China for the past few decades. But those days seem like they are probably over. Uh, you can ask, I guess, the Vietnamese oil company ship people about that. They could tell you all about that. Uh, China is becoming more combative and aggressive in its claims uh, internationally. It's trying to assert itself farther away from China. And even Chinese fishing boats are becoming more aggressive. They are going further and further into what most people think are other countries' waters. Uh, so China is becoming more aggressive. And it's destabilizing the, the system that's been in place for decades. Here's a map of what is called exclusive economic zone. 
So these blue lines are the exclusive economic zones. Basically, the international standard for control of water is 200 nautical miles from your coast. It's uh, 360, 370 kilometers or so. And these blue lines show, if they followed that, what that would look like. So here is China, and this would be their zone. This is what they would have control over. They would control the oil that's there, the fishing. This red line shows you what China claims. This is what they say is theirs. So this is what, internationally, what would be the norm for their claim. And this is what they claim, which is basically all of the South China Sea. And if that looks like it's excessive and aggressive, that's because it is. Uh, it's pretty unprecedented. And it has obviously angered all of these countries, which here you can see what their international claims should be. So it's, it's much more than other countries are claiming. Uh, so the Chinese claims has kind of disrupted all of this. It's very unclear. And there are a lot of countries that are involved in this pretty small area. I also want to talk a bit about the string of pearls. And the string of pearls is this strategy. It is this black line. And it's a Chinese strategy to defend its shipping lanes. So I showed you the map earlier about oil coming from the Middle East around India, through the Strait of Malacca, South China Sea, and up to China. So this is the oil shipping lane, which is obviously really important to China. If China doesn't have oil anymore, their economy stops, and they have a huge problem, especially going forward. They need oil. This line is where China is working to put military bases. They're trying to expand their military along this line to defend this shipping line. And that means this. China is working with countries and islands along the Strait of Pearl Line to put in bases. So they, that means they are working with these countries there building shipping ports for these countries, and in exchange, they want to put some of their naval ships at these ports. Things like that. And if you look, I'll go back. If you look at this line, that pretty much chokes in all of these countries, and it has made them feel very insecure about their own defense. So especially as China's military continues to grow, they get ships like aircraft carriers, which can go very far from China. That makes countries like India especially feel very insecure. Okay, so China is putting in these bases, they are working, and this will, I think, continue to happen over the next few years. Uh, just based in Sri Lanka, they have all along this line, all throughout Asia. And, and as I said, this will help them kind of project their power a little bit more. So as their navy becomes more powerful, they can go further out and they can defend what they think is the line uh, that they need to protect their economy and make sure their country keeps going strong. Okay, let's move up to the Yellow Sea. So here's the Yellow Sea, South Korea, and here's China. And at the beginning of the presentation, I showed you a picture of the Chonin, which was sunk in 2010. So I want to give you a local example of why this matters and how it's related. And the Chonin is a local example. So the Chonin was somewhere around here when it was sunk. And in the aftermath of that, uh, as kind of a show of commitment and strength, the US and Korean navies, they planned a joint training program. They wanted to put some of their naval ships right over here and move them around, work together, and basically show North Korea that they controlled that area. It was a show of strength. So that was, everyone agreed that was probably the right thing to do. Other countries didn't really have a problem with that. It made sense. But China objected to that. And part of it is China is a, a pretty close ally with North Korea. But most people think the reason why they objected is because they look at this as being their territory. So China, uh, even then, was becoming a little bit more aggressive in its claims. They thought the US Navy, in particular, should not be operating in this area. So that kind of explains what their, uh, what their reasons were for objecting to this, this, military, this military training that was not it was not a very big deal. Most people thought it was the right thing to do, but China objected. And it, it alienated a lot of countries to China. It was seen as hard to understand China's perspective. 
Uh, one, one way to think about China's perspective in all of this is that China, it needs to secure the water to secure its own country. If something happens in the waters, China has a lot of problems. So they are trying to defend themselves by defending the waters that are vital to its success. But it's, it's not clear if they're making things better or making things worse. So China feels they are stepping up their defense of themselves by doing this. I think uh, people in China wouldn't say they're being aggressive, they're being defensive. But it's not interpreted that way by many other people. And, and China says, <coughs> says that it feels isolated by other countries. Uh, the US especially has kind of been a, more aggressive against China uh, in the past few years as well. There's a lot of uh, talk about a Cold War uh, with China right now from people in the US. And, and that's probably <coughs> extreme. But China feels threatened as well. So no one feels safer as a result of what's happening. Let's talk about these island chains that are disputed. This is the Paracel Islands. Well, this is one of the islands. It looks very beautiful, a uh, pretty small island. But uh, it's not very important. This, these islands are not very good. Uh, no one really lives there. There are no permanent residents. There are some military bases and things like that. But mostly their importance is strategic. It's not, it's not a place where you're going to go on a trip. People are going to move there. It's important for other reasons. Uh, this chain, the Paracels, uh, it is claimed by three countries, by Taiwan, China, and Vietnam. Uh, it's beautiful, but there are no permanent residents. No one's living here. These claims on this island chain, they date back hundreds of years. Uh, in modern claims, France and Vietnam, they claimed it in the 1930s. Japan took over during World War II. And then after that, China and Vietnam took control of the islands. And China and Vietnam actually fought a really brief war in the 1970s over these islands that, as I said, are not very important. They're not very good islands. It's more strategic where the location is. So these are the Paracel Islands. Here's a map here shows you the Paracel Islands. They're close to Vietnam and China. And next I want to talk about the Spratly Islands, which are these. That's a little bit bigger chain. And it's even more complicated than the Paracel Islands. There are six countries that claim parts of the Spratly Islands. That is China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Brunei, Philippines, and Malaysia. So six countries claim this. There are no native islanders on the Spratly Islands. So no one has a really great historical claim necessarily. But today, 45 of the Spratly Islands, 45 of them, have a military presence of some kind. So the six countries have really been trying to secure what they think is their claim. Uh, it has a similar history. France claimed it, and then China, then Japan, and China took control back after World War II. In the South China Sea, in total, there are more than 250 islands, and really none of them are that nice of islands. In fact, most of them have no people, and every day at high tide, a lot of these islands are totally submerged. So these islands are not very good uh, from an island standpoint. It's only strategic. There are no native animals. Uh, there is a lot of good seafood, a lot of good fishing opportunities around these islands, which is part of why they're important. But the most important thing that they offer is natural resources. A lot of people think there's a lot of oil and natural gas on the seabed around these islands. And if you can control these islands, you can access those natural resources, which obviously help when you don't have any uh, gas deposits on your own. And I'll give you another Korean example. This is it's called a rock. In, in English, it's called so Socotra rock. And this is what it looks like. You might see there is no rock. The rock is actually submerged. It's about 15 feet underwater, 5 meters. And it's more of a reef. And in Korean, it's yodo or parando. And this is disputed between Korea and China. And this is a Korean scientific research station that's on this rock. And there's a nice little helipad you can fly in there. But it's, it's uh, disputed. So China and Korea also have some disputes about sovereignty. So Korea is not exempt from this issue, unfortunately. Pretty much everyone in Asia is arguing about who owns what. OK, let's, let's go back to something a little bit more positive again. Let's talk about the Association of Southeast Asian Nations a little bit more. So they are involved in the disputes because, as you might notice, a lot of these countries have these conflicting claims. I said Malaysia, Vietnam. Philippines, Brunei, 
these countries claim the lands. And Indonesia is also involved. Uh, they've had some skirmishes with China in the past few years. Uh, this organization, they have been working together more closely. So in the past few years, they've, they've become a more uh, coherent group. They're working together more than they ever have in their history. And this issue has kind of brought them together. Uh, and as a result of working together, they have a lot more strength than if they work individually. If you think about uh, a place like Brunei, on its own, if it's negotiating with China, it doesn't have a whole lot of power. Obviously, China is, has a much bigger economy, a much bigger military. Brunei can't really pressure them very much. But working in this form, with 10 nations total, they can pressure China a bit more. And the goal with, with this, uh, in particular, is to get China to work with the group uh, to kind of conform to the international standards. Also, uh, some of these countries have submitted their claims to the United Nations. Uh, there's something called the Law of the Sea, and they're trying to work through that to figure out who actually should control some of these islands, who should control some of these waters that are really important. So there is some hope for an international, uh, a multi-group uh, answer to this problem, maybe. On a related note, uh, I want to talk about the U.S. pivot. Uh, last year, President, <coughs> President Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, they announced this pivot towards Asia. Uh, the idea behind this is that after September 11th, the U.S. became focused on the Middle East. Obviously, we, there were some wars that the United States was fighting there, so they were distracted a bit. But after those wars, now they're, they're winding down, the U.S. Uh, is able to look towards Asia because, as President Obama has said, Asia is where the important things will be happening in international relations over the next few decades. So this pivot is to kind of secure the partnership with Asian countries to make sure that Asia is safe and that one country, such as China, can't disrupt this system. Uh, part of this pivot is more uh, naval ships in the Pacific. Here's an aircraft carrier, and for a while there was only one aircraft carrier in the Pacific from the U.S. The U.S. has, I believe, 11 aircraft carriers. So one out of 11, that's not very many. But in 2010, they started to send more, and now there are three aircraft carriers in the Pacific Ocean. So that's one sign that they're stepping up their, uh, their work in, in Asia. Also, the Australia Base Agreement I mentioned right at the beginning, that, that is in another example. And the Australia Base Agreement, there will be some Marines in Australia, that is right next to Indonesia. So if there's some kind of fighting in these waterways, the US military will be closer. Uh, they have also reached military agreements with other countries, uh, sharing submarines and other ships like this, and, and base agreements, similar to what China is doing with its string of pearls. So the US is has a, a kind of a similar strategy, trying to work with these countries, get some agreements, and hopefully they can defend the waterways, make sure that it's secure. And agreements with Asian countries. And the U.S. has also stepped up their criticism of China. Uh, they've, the Chinese, the, the future ruler of China, is in the U.S. right now, actually, visiting. And on this trip, he's gotten a lot of criticism from President Obama and the Vice President, People have been very blunt uh, about what they think the problems are that China is causing right now. So I think that as China becomes more aggressive, the U.S. is also being pretty aggressive with what they think China needs to change. Here's a map. Uh, this is related to the pivot. Here's Darwin, Australia. This is where the Marines will be based. As you can see, that's really close to these waterways. They, they will be able to get into here. There's, uh, here's the Strait of Malacca and South China Sea. So this location is not an accident. It was very strategic, this announcement. And it shows a commitment between Australia and the US. And it's not just the US, it should be noted, that is kind of pushing for these things. The, a lot of these countries and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, they have called for the US to be more committed to Asia. So it's, it kind of works both ways. The, a lot of these countries want the US to be more involved, to make sure that these places are safe. And the US, it's in their interest to be more involved as well. And the goal is, hopefully, to pressure China in particular to cooperate with others, to not be aggressive, to not try to do things alone, to try to work through international means to clear up any problems and make sure that everyone 
uh, continues to benefit from open waterways. Everybody benefits from being able to bring ships to the Strait of Malacca and South China Sea, and they want to make sure it stays that way. So what's next? Uh, I will attempt to peer into the crystal ball and see what I can come up with. I think in 2010, that was the year that China really stepped up its aggression. They were, uh, they started doing things like chasing other ships in waters. They became a lot more aggressive. In 2011, that was the year that other countries pushed back against this. So that is like the uh, Southeast Asian group. They became more aggressive in trying to fight off uh, Chinese attempts. And I think 2012 will hopefully be the year of cooperation when the different parties, they can come together and figure out some sort of solution to this issue. Hopefully. I don't know. Maybe I'm off. But I think the issue is too important to ignore. And I think if it continues on this path, it will become harder to come to a consensus. So hopefully uh, this is the year when some cooperation gets underway. On a related note, <laughs> why shouldn't you be worried? Well, if this happens, you should be very worried. <laughs> but this isn't what will happen. In the Cold War, with the, between the US and the Soviet Union, uh, there was something that protected us, and kind of crazy, it, is, it was basically this. It was Mutually Assured Destruction, MAD. And that protected everybody, because if one country shot a nuclear missile, the other countries would retaliate. So if the US tried to blow up the Soviet Union, the same thing would happen to the US. And as a result of this terrible outcome that would happen, it, we, everyone in the world was safer. There were less wars than there probably would have been without the nuclear weapons. This isn't really the issue today. I don't think we're in a cold war. Some people would say that we are in regards to the waterways in Asia. But the same logic as this protects us. And I think you could call it MADE, which is Mutually Assured Destruction of the Economy. If a country like China started a war, they would guarantee that their own economy and a lot of other economies in the world would be completely destroyed as a result of it. And the same if the US attacked China. So I don't think there will be any complete war because it would be so destructive. It's in no one's best interest to do that. And as a result, I think there is a lot more pressure to, do, to solve this diplomatically. I don't think there will be fighting. I think there will be more uh, naval ships and, and that probably is a reality. There will probably be a lot more defense budget in Asia, but I don't think anyone's going to start a war. And I don't think blockades or putting in mines or ships, I don't think that that is the answer. And I'm sure the Chinese leaders and American leaders and all of the leaders in Asia realize that as well. So I think the ideal solution is the U.S. continues its presence in Asia, but it doesn't go away from Asia. It makes sure that the waters are open and safe. I think a regional forum, maybe through the United Nations or another group uh, should be established to take care of disputes, to resolve these conflicts that have been going on for decades but have really become more important in the past few years. I think there needs to be a role, a, a, a bigger role for China in the area. Maybe China and the U.S. could work together to, they could share their resources and make sure that the waters stay open, protected the waters from things like uh, piracy, which is a big issue in the Strait of Malacca. Uh, I didn't talk about that, but that, that is also an issue. So maybe China and the U.S. could work together. Uh, and hopefully, as a result of a bigger role for China, they won't scare their neighbors. So China, I think, needs to feel safe and secure in the water in order to back down, and hopefully that happens. And if there's continued openness of the world's waterways, I think everyone wins. So I'm optimistic that's what will happen. Thank you for coming today.